everyone. Uh, welcome to Waters. Today we're talking about birds, and butterflies, and bees. So basically, this idea is instead of just gardening for looks, let's actually garden for um, attracting uh, desirable animals and even helping out the ecosystem. So let's bring in our pollinators, let's bring in the birds, let's bring in those hummingbirds that we like to watch out the window. Let's bring in those beautiful butterflies. You know, Arizona has gorgeous butterflies, doesn't it? Those swallowtails are huge. That one seems to be one of our most common butterflies, is that great big yellow swallowtail. It's enormous. So we have a, you know, beautiful uh, birds and wildlife and insects here. So let's uh, actually work with them in, in our gardens and, and really um, make our, our, our landscape a living space where we can kind of live with uh, what we uh, what is native here and really enjoy it. So today we're, we're really going to focus uh, a lot on what to plant and also a few tips on helping to attract and protect those butterflies, birds, and bees once you've attracted them to the garden. So up here you see I have a, a very big assortment of things. It's not just, we, we often think of, of flowers, you know, little flowers that we can put in the, in the yard that's going to bring in butterflies. It's, we can actually go far beyond that. You can see I have a tree here. There's actually more trees out there we're going to talk about. We have vines, we have shrubs, ground covers. You can actually incorporate this into your entire landscape. Whatever it is you're needing, you can bring this uh, to the table when you're thinking of what you can plant for bees and butterflies and bees and, and birds. So, you know, some of the, these, again, kind of obvious, these are classic. No butterflies love these. Butterflies absolutely adore these. I have lantana here. This is actually Miss Huff. It's the only lantana that grows here in Prescott. Mm. Uh, actually survives our winters, but it's down to about 10 degrees. So you put this uh, up by the house, and it'll just keep coming back every year. It doesn't have this problem. Uh, Rubecchia, this is the Black Eyed Susan family. This one really made a hit when it came in. I mean, look at this color. So these are, these are classics that we know about. But I, I wanted to expand on that a little bit. So let's talk about what it is we, we need uh, for those bees, those birds, and those butterflies. So some of it is, is uh, in the case of birds, the birds, you have hummingbirds that are after the nectar and then the songbirds that are after the seeds and the insects on the plants. So what I tried to do was I tried to find a lot of plants up here that would do double duty, not just uh, be a flower for the pollinators, but also produce a seed or fruit that the birds would like to, to eat or have a nectar that the hummingbirds would like. So you'll see things up here that maybe you hadn't thought of before. Uh, for example, the Virginia creeper. You need a vine, you got Virginia creeper, this one is a variegated variety. This is beautiful. I love this right here. If you look closely, I know you can't see from where you are because they're green right now. It's actually got berries all over it. They're edible for the birds. So this is something that's going to do double duty, and you know how big a Virginia creeper can get. If you've got a, a, a space that really needs covering, this can do it. And that's a, a large area now that is feeding those birds during this coming time of year. When fall and winter come, things start getting kind of scarce out there to feed on, they're really actually going to be very dependent on seeds and berries during the winter. So things like the Virginia creeper, here's another one you might not have thought of. This one is a uh, holly. Now this doesn't look like a regular holly. I know a lot of you don't like prickly stuff, so I made sure to grab the one that's not. This one's completely unprickly. This is called sky pencil holly, so if you've got a shady spot and it needs a shrub, you got a non-prickly holly here that's going to make a berry that's going to uh, feed the birds during the winter. Now, holly berries aren't really good for humans and mammals to eat, so don't go thinking, no, I can you know, pick it and put it on my cake, but for the birds, it's actually very good. Very, very nutritious berry does a lot of good for the birds during the winter time. In fact, you'll notice that the birds kind of leave it until everything else is dying off because the berries last for so long on holly. They last through the winter, so it gives the birds something to eat during winter. Over here, I have an unusual type of Mahonia. Now, you, most of you are familiar with the Oregon grape holly that looks like a false holly. I think you're typically 
uh, familiar with this one. This is actually the same family, just a different look. So when you're looking for something different, these are both evergreen. There's many different varieties of Mahonia. They all get beautiful yellow flowers in spring, which are definitely going to bring those hummingbirds and those butterflies and those bees in the spring. And they're going to look lovely. And then those flowers are going to turn into these little purple grape-like berries. Kind of a tart little berry, very juicy, and that the, the birds can enjoy. What is that? How tall did it get? It actually depends on the variety. So kind of think about what, what height you want and say, is there a Mahonia that fits that? And there probably is. So uh, for example, this type here, there's several varieties. Um, this one, this is the full height of this one. This is more of a ground cover. This is the full height that this, this gets to. We also have some that get to three foot, others that get to five or six. This one I think is more of the five foot variety. Let me see if I can remember. Three to four foot for this particular variety. Excuse me, what do they call? Mahonia. Um, this one that looks like a holly is often referred to as Oregon grape holly or just plain Oregon grape. Um, this one is the uh, Narihia Mahonia. Okay. What is that? We have Mahonia compact. It's a one variety. That's uh, the type that is around three foot, maybe four. really pretty. Some of them, in fact, Mahoney is even leaf color. Uh, some of them turn purple, others orange, depending on the, the variety that you get. So they can be very pretty additions to your landscape. Let's see. So again, I have lots of flowers up here that will produce seeds. Uh, this one's a seed, and now these are buds. They're going to turn into red flowers very soon. They're going to be kind of a pinkish red. Beautiful color. This is that new sunflower that everyone's been talking about. Came out this year. This is the one that gets up to about a thousand blooms in this season. Imagine how many seeds that produces. Of course, what's also great about it is that it starts blooming sooner than other sunflowers as well. So you get a long season of non-stop blooming from this thing. It just it's been a big seller this year, just came out, just uh, beautiful. It's called Sun Believable Sunflower. Sun Believable. And this thing, this thing, what is this? This came in May. I've actually been going. Most sunflowers don't start in August. This one's been going since May. Let's see. Now, of course, what else do I have? I want to talk about more of the seeds and then I'll talk about some of the hummingbirds. That one's pretty easy. This is another Rudbeckia, that black-eyed Susan family. Again, always fabulous. One of the things that I love about Echinacea and black-eyed Susan, they bloom all summer. Just like that sunflower right there. They bloom all summer. They start about May-ish and then just keep going until about frost, until about October. They just keep going. And so as long as they're being fed well, you're going to have lots of flowers like this. This one's younger, it's a little smaller, but there's a lot of flowers and buds on this actually. There's a, uh, uh, there's probably about 10 buds on this guy. Hardiness, definitely cold hardy enough for here. They go down to like minus 10 or something like that. Yeah, very cold hardy. So up here in the mountains where we need things to be cold hardy, almost everything on this table is actually perennial. Uh, we also have a lot of annuals. For those of you who like to, to change it up and use annuals, a lot of annuals that we could talk about. Hey, come, come to me after the class, we'll go through and we'll find some pretty annuals, annuals, whatever you need. Yes. How tall do the sunflowers get? How, how tall? How tall? Um, this one's actually a shorter variety, just a few feet. Oh. Yeah, so it's not one of the huge ones, but it, it'll t turn into like a nice bush, just be covered. And deer are crazy about sunflowers. So that's a, another plus about a lot of what's on this table. Yes. Do you have to use certain soil for them? Do you have to use certain soil for them? Great, uh, great question. If you're putting it in a pot, use a quality potting soil. Um, like all the ones we sell are pretty safe. Um, 
we have, it, if you're putting in the ground, just use the, the planting guide that we give you when you check out. That says uh, use the premium mulch, mix that with the, the native soil and, and, uh, and plant. So as long as it's just a good draining soil, the nice thing about the, the flowers that attract butterflies and bees, they have a tendency to be tougher plants. They have a tendency to be more in the wildflower range and the native range. You know, that they're tougher plants. So if you're looking for an easier type of garden, you're in the right place. When you start gardening for the wildlife, you just start gardening better. They go together. Because now you're, you're starting to think like the ecosystem. You're thinking like nature. So you, you get more wild stuff. So the stuff, I mean, it's beautiful, but it's tough as a weed. And that's, that's a great thing about it. When you go down to the, uh, uh, the store and look at wildflower seeds, some of you may decide to go from seed. You'll see a few mixes. Uh, one of them is the, the uh, deer resistant, deer and rabbit resistant. It's a great way to go. But <laughs> that's because those are flowers that are kind of used to growing in, in natural areas where there's a lot of animal life. But they attract lots and lots of birds, lots of insects, uh, particularly pollinators. So let's see what else have I got up here. You can see, now I think I brought something more obvious. I want a big flower so you can see it. Here we go. Let's take that. Okay. This is actually a vine that has been trained with a trunk to, to be a topiary. So this one with trimming will keep a beautiful tree shape. You could put it pretty much anywhere you, you want to. This is actually a trumpet creeper. This is a perfect example of what attracts hummingbirds. Now hummingbirds will go for just about anything, but their favorites are always these trumpet shaped flowers. So anything like uh, the, the trumpet vine, is a big hit with them. I've got, here it is, that's what I was looking for. This is, this is a hosta. And you can see, again, kind of tubular flowers. It's always a win-win when it comes to hummingbirds. If that's your thing, this is what you want. Yes. Now, some of this, most of what I brought up is sun-loving. We also have plenty of shade. I did bring up a few uh, here in Arizona. We actually do have shade in some places once in a while. <laughs> but uh, we, we need things that are good and heat tolerant. And this actually does amazingly well as long as it's not right out there in the afternoon sun. It does very well uh, here in this area. And it has been blooming all summer long. Same with this trumpet vine. This particular variety, they've actually got two of the largely uh, large flowered varieties. You notice that the flowers are bigger than normal. So they're beautiful flowers, but uh, you can see they've actually got two different colors grafted in them. Give it some added interest. You see how I have a... Uh, Here we have some examples of tubular flowers. Big hits with hummingbirds. I've got, this is a popsicle poker. Kind of like a red hot poker, but smaller with popsicle colors. They all look like papaya and lemon and mango. Really bright. Here I've got a, a, a society garlic. Again, these are really tough plants. I've got one of these at home. And the same thing uh, with, with uh, garlic and garlic-like uh, plants. I've got some of these at home. I put them in the places where I can't run irrigation. So again, you're looking at tougher plants. This is a great way to garden when you start thinking about uh, animals and insects. You're gonna end up with tougher plants. So I've got these in places where I water when I think about it, or when the rain counts, you know, that kind of thing. I do a lot of the xeriscaping at home. I've got a lot of areas where I'm, just, I'm not gonna run the, the drip out to. So they're on their own, for the most part. Mexican hat, this is a great one for the pollinators. Basically, when you're thinking pollinators, um, yes? Can you grow the trumpet vine in a pot? Can you grow a trumpet vine in a pot? That would look great in a pot. Because it, I, have, I have a patio, you get a little bit of morning sun, and about 3 o'clock you get blazing. I've known lots of people to put vines in pots. I've got vines in pots at home. Yeah, you do kind of have to trim out them a bit because they're going to try to grow out all the place. So yeah, you're going to trim from time to time, uh, just like you would with any topiary, really. So a little trimming. Uh, most people trim pretty regularly in their yards. You know, they're trimming the hedges, the bushes, so it's not a big deal. 
So yeah, a little trimming and you're good to go. So basically when you're looking at pollinators, they like the flowers that tend to be kind of like a cluster or have a lot of a, a big pollen head. So that's your hummingbirds, they like the, the, tru uh, the trumpet look, although they will go for the other stuff too. So you get a mixture of these in and you're just good to go. You're, you're gonna have so many choices to choose from. Let's see. I don't think I've ever done a class without a rose in it, have I? <laughs> I always seem to have one in here. It happens every time. I've got an iceberg here. I just grabbed this one because it was pretty. I could have chosen any rose. Roses actually are great because not only will they feed anything that's after nectar, like bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds, but they actually make a, an edible hit after they're done. Which brings me to another uh, point that I want to make. If you're gardening, for the birds, specifically. Don't deadhead. We're kind of taking a, a, a rule that I normally teach and turning it on at its head here. Normally I say, you want a deadhead, you want to take off the spit blooms, and that encourages more blooming. This time you're actually going to take that rule, you're going to throw it out the window. Because you want it to go to seed. That way the, the birds have something, uh, something that they can eat. So the folks on camera are saying, could you just kind of scooch it closer to the lens so they can see it? <laughs> so just kind of people asking, anyway, there you yeah. go, roses. I, they're gorgeous, aren't they? Uh, and they all have, have that edible hip. And actually that hip is very good for you, by the way. If you harvest a few for yourself, higher than in vitamin C and some other nutrients and oranges. Very good for you, make a great tea. Kind of a, kind of a cranberry flavor is what most people say. Sometimes I'm not sure how to describe it. Uh, the, if you want it, want it for your tea, get it in uh, fall after they've turned red because it gets cold and then they, they plump up and they turn red. That's when you're going to get your best hips. So it's okay if you, uh, you know, share with the birds a little bit. It's okay. What else have I got up here? Oh, yes, more trees. I don't know if you recognize the desert willow. Again, super tough tree. This is all, that one that you sometimes see growing along the the roadsides going down to Skull Valley or in Dewey, they're everywhere. Very tough desert tree. It's not a willow. It's not a willow family. It's not one of those water hogs. This is super good on water. You're going to love this. And just in the summertime, covered in these pink flowers. Different shades of pink depending on the variety. This one has a fantastic color. Let me pull this out so you can see it. And some of them will create seeds as well. That will also be good for you. So you can see the, the color on that. These have been looming a couple months. So they've been going for a while. Beautiful, beautiful plant. And again, I like things that are easy on water. We're in the desert. We should be. How, <laughs> I don't. how large will it get? How large will it get? Usually you're looking at about 15 to 20 foot. It's not the hugest tree, but big enough to give you shade and look nice in the yard without being this overwhelming thing that takes over. Lovely tree. So again, you do want to be careful about deadheading. I, I sometimes do this. I'll have areas where I'll, I'll go in and start deadheading out of habit and then, oh, stop, stop. <laughs> I need to let those go to seed. And it also allows uh, the seed to fall and you know whatever escapes the birds will actually grow new plants so if you've got a wildflower area if you've got like a field a lot of you are right on the edge of a, a of a field just kind of growing wild if you want to spread some some flowers throughout there either plant them or spread some seed great way to go i would still recommend i would still recommend fertilizing even though they're kind of uh, of a more natural plant, when you help them out, you're going to get better blooms. You're going to get more blooms. You're going to get long-term blooming. So I still recommend fertilizing on a regular basis. So this is an example. This was covered in white flowers. This was something, if you had come in a week or two ago into the uh, lower greenhouse where the, all the perennials were, and you smelled something that was just intoxicating, it was just so sweet smelling down there. This is what it was, it was summer sweet. We got in a great big batch of it. And they were just covered in these white flowers. 
and it was amazing how fragrant they were. Still are, actually, even though um, they've kind of, we, we went through and deadheaded a lot. You can see there's not as many flowers on it, but it's actually got a lot of buds. I know, again, it's hard for you to see. There's a lot of buds on this, and it's already starting to break out again. So this is, again, going to be covered in flowers and just so sweet smelling. This is summer sweet, and depending on the variety that you get, you're looking at around two to three foot or three to five. Great looking plant. And it's been doing very well. Doing very well. You'll have to come up here when you're done and smell this, because even now with only so many flowers on it, it's still very fragrant. So you'll, you'll definitely want to keep up with that. Uh, talk to us about fertilizers. We've got two great fertilizers that I talk about all the time. We've got the Water Cell Purpose. Makes everything very healthy. Uh, it keeps the plants healthy. It helps them to produce nutritious fruits and seeds. Bigger, better flowers, just better color. Uh, it's, it's a great fertilizer. It, it's a really nutritious food. And then we've also got that Flower Power, which is very high in phosphorus. That's the part that makes the flower bloom. That's what makes the plant just want to put on as many flowers as possible. So between those two, you've got two great fertilizers, and you can even use them in conjunction with each other. Again, there's a lot that you can do for your landscape without, uh, you know, that you might not have expected. I've got uh, some cotone asters up here. A lot of different types. Some of them are ground covers, because I know a lot of you need ground covers. We're in the, in the mountains. Uh, we have a lot of hillsides and slopes to stabilize. We use a lot of ground covers. Cotone aster is a great evergreen ground cover. Uh, this one's actually a bush type. This is the gray leaf cotone aster. The others are usually greener. You, again, you can't see it yet, but this is covered in berries. It had white, little white flowers, like a snow shower, all over it in the spring. The bees and the butterflies loved it. They do it every spring and it's wonderful, just covered up with these little white flowers. And now they've turned to berries and pretty soon they're gonna ripen to red and then you will see it. Lots and lots of berries. So again, great color for the yard, great food for the birds. Yes. I have a tree that's on the side of our gazebo, mm -hmm. and the beets or the uh, seeds keep dropping, and my dogs keep eating them. Okay. Uh, is it poisonous? Which kind of tree is it? <laughs> or, I would say if, if you have something in your yard that's questionable, bring it in for identification. Okay. Yeah. Because some things birds can eat and we can't. Yeah. Now, it, I have to say no, I'm one thing. Dogs. Yeah. Dogs. Yeah. Yes. Here's what I have to say. A lot of times you will find a plant on the toxic list. Now, there are some plants that are really, really dangerous. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of them up here. Like oleander, that one's bad. <laughs> they have them down in Phoenix. We don't have them up here. They can't take the cold. In most cases, when something comes up on that list that says toxic, it basically means if you eat a whole lot of those berries, you're going to get sick to your stomach. So it's not, I, I get this question a lot. People are always worried, you know, am I going to accidentally poison the kids or the grandkids when they come over to visit? Yeah. In most cases, let's say you have one of those kids or dogs that nibbles on things, that wants to try everything out. They'll put a berry in their mouth, find out it doesn't taste good, and walk away. They love them. They love them. <laughs> then they come in the house and throw up. Yes. And some of them will do that. They'll, they'll kind of irritate the stomach yeah. and then you throw up and then, okay, the, the dog has learned his lesson about no, that particular barrier stage. <laughs> <laughs> Most likely it's, it's irritation from the hole or the shell. Well, I've Something been like told that. that there's like alcohol in them. Could be. So. <laughs> Maybe something kind of similar. It's a party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I would say bring it in. Let's get it identified and find out if it's something to really be concerned about or is it just irritating his stomach because it's rough textured. Yeah. It, it may not be anything really serious. And then once it's identified, I would say go in to your vet because your vet knows what's yeah. going on better than we do. We know our plants, but your vet knows your dog. And it could be that the dog is doing it for a reason. Sometimes the vet will figure out that something else is happening. You know, it, it could be that he's uh, craving a certain nutrient. Uh, could be he's even self-medicating. You know, sometimes animals do this. They can smell something that we can't. Yeah. So just go into your vet and he'll probably be able to explain it and say, here's what you do and problem solve. So just bring it in for us to identify. Okay. 
So. What is the pink plant over there? Which I. It has pink I, flowers on it? Sorry. I've got two. Let me grab them both. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, yes, I had a hibiscus with a fading flower on it. These have been blooming for the past couple of months. Thank you. Can I have that elderberry there? Thank you. So this hibiscus, yeah, sorry, the flowers already faded a little bit, but you can see it's very, very large. Um, this is a, a machito hibiscus. It actually goes down to minus 30, even though it looks like it came from Hawaii but it goes down to minus 30, very cold hardy. So you just take this home and plant them and he'll perform for you every summer. Generally about July, they'll start blooming and the flowers are enormous. Beautiful, beautiful flowers. They come in different shades of pink or white, purple in most cases. Just two or three foot tall. Not a, a big shrub, but just big enough to, to really make a, a scene. <laughs> Look really fabulous. Now, we can't really talk much about butterflies, can we, without bringing in the milkweed, right? So this, this is just one of many kinds of milkweed. And some milkweeds are, are even native here to Arizona. So they all do very, very well here. They love lots of sun. Um, they can take dryness. Again, super tough flower. So uh, some of them are uh, annuals, meaning they're going to die in the winter, but drop seed and start new ones. Oh, uh, there's a perennial that will actually come back every year from root. And which one is this one? Let's see, this one, this one I got uh, from up here. This is an animal. Uh, and it gets about three foot tall. It's called the red butterfly's milkweed. And a lot of milkweeds are really very pretty. And if anybody wants to talk milkweed or monarch, the person you need to talk to is Patty down there at the store. She's going to be uh, here on Monday. Uh, she's always here during the first half of the week. She is our local monarch uh, uh, haven. Uh, she's got the biggest uh, butterfly garden in the state. In the, in the, in the, sorry, in the, in the city. Probably one of the top in the state as well. Uh, and really knows her stuff about monarchs. You want to ask any question about monarchs, she can tell you stuff you never thought to ask. So she, and she's got... Well, some like, I don't know, 10, 20 types of milkweed in your yard. She's tried everything out. I asked her once, is there any milkweed that just doesn't perform that well or as well as the others? She said, no, they actually all do really great here. There isn't one that really does underperforms. Uh, there's, there's one called Swamp Milkweed, needs more water, comes from, uh, you know, kind of bog lands. Other than that, um, it does great. So there's, it doesn't matter which one you pick, just decide whether you want annual or perennial and, and go from there. And of course you can always pick it. It, it. If you can eat it, the birds will probably enjoy it too. So here I've got an elderberry. Berries aren't quite ripe yet, but this is going to make lots of berries. It flowered earlier, obviously. And now the flowers have turned to berries. Lots of berries for uh, the birds to, to eat. Here I've got a great vine. So if you need a decorative vine, that will also give food for the, the birds. If you don't feel like harvesting the grapes, don't worry, the birds will take care of it for you. No problems. You can see I had to water a few things before bringing them up here. So anything that uh, is edible that you don't think will make too much of a mess for you to clean up, you can also go ahead and plant it for them. They'll enjoy it. And here's the other pink dye we were talking about. This is spirea. Again, this has been blooming all summer. Spireas are... Spirina? Spirina? Spirea, yes. They come in white and pink. The pink varieties seem to, to bloom longer, though. Remember that uh, shrub that was covered in white flowers late spring? Looked like it had been snowed on. That was the bridal wreath spirea that you saw around town. And then after that, the, the pink takes over as... Um, as the, the star of the show. So this is the, the one, of, one of the pink spireas, and they've just been blooming and blooming. Butterflies, pollinators love these. They just adore these flowers, and they keep blooming, so you get long-term use out of them. 
Let's see, any, any questions? Once again, the vine that's right behind you, that one there. This one? This one actually is an abelia, it's a shrub, but it has an arching effect that they grow loud and kind of arch gracefully. And it does get full. You know, as it gets bigger, it gets full. It, it won't be airy like this, but it'll still have an airy look because of that arching effect. This is one of the abelias. This is a glossy abelia. And it's got, I don't know, I don't know if you can see it from there, but it's got those trumpet-shaped flowers that the hummingbirds love. And the, the, the butterflies love them too because they're, they, they're short enough that the butterflies can get their head in there. So it, this is a great one to have in the garden. It gets around, what is it, three to five foot? Really, really pretty. And the more they grow, the, the prettier they look. It grows well in containers. I've got one in a pot. Oh, that would look fantastic in a container. Yes. Uh, over here, I've got a honeysuckle that just came in. This is gonna be, this is the one that is covered in white and yellow blooms all summer. It just keeps it a bloom and then recover and just bloom again and be covered in a shower of flowers. That one in particular is actually evergreen. So if you're looking for an evergreen, that's gonna bring your hummingbirds and then your songbirds are gonna <coughs> eat at the, the berries and hips when it's done. How about yes. pruning that back? Pruning the honeysuckle or the abelia? The honeysuckle. We've got a huge one. Oh, just hack at it. <laughs> you can't do it wrong. I don't, can you hurt a vine? <laughs> I don't think you can. Uh, especially once established. I mean, you can just hack away and grow right back. Well, this one is full of hummingbirds. Yes. Oh, yes. Hummingbirds love honeysuckle. So, great one for honey, for hummingbirds. You can use it as both a vine for climbing and also as a ground cover. And some people even trim it up into a bush. Very versatile. I think I'm starting to get buried in class in here. <laughs> Any other questions? Can you talk about that tree? Oh, the red bud. Yes. I thought I had already mentioned it, but now that you mentioned it, now I didn't. This is a red bud. I wanted to bring up some examples of trees that are good for uh, flowers and seeds. This is one of them. Uh, we have several different varieties of red bud. And each one is beautiful in its own right. This one gets, uh, the, the new leaves come out purple. During late spring, it's gonna be covered in fuchsia colored flowers. It's stunning, which of course the pollinators love. And then actually those flowers will turn to little seeds. Uh, they won't be messy, but they'll be just real close alongside the, the branch. That uh, feeds, feeds the birds throughout the season as well. So these are some great examples of how you can use every part of your yard, not just the flower bed, to attract birds and, and butterflies. How tall depends on the variety. Most of them aren't huge though. They're typically, you know, 20 feet or so. Uh, there are a few that are even smaller. Um, one of them is even a bush really. There's a weeping red bud. I think we have some small ones still in stock. The big ones are, are all gone except for that one in that big, big pot over there. They're, they were so gorgeous, they just didn't last. But we still have a few. If you're interested in seeing the weeping red bud, they're beautiful. What about star jasmine? You know, that starts coming out with white flowers, spring Star flowers jasmine is a great one. It is an annual for most of us. Um, someone came in yesterday and said she's got one Kind of tucked into a warm spot out in the eastern part of Dewey and, and every every winter she wraps it up and she actually gets it through the winter. Uh, you know Dewey's a little warmer especially on the eastern side. Most of us though if we try to, to get it through the winter it's not going to make it so it is it is an annual. I get this a lot because people remember jasmine in other states and they grew it year-round. Here it is a bit too cold but they grow so fast that you can put one in and, and watch it grow up into something really pretty by the end of the summer and it blooms like crazy and they're very fragrant. So it's a great choice. Vines are fast growing, so you get a lot out of them. So you come in here, they'll, they'll be here. We probably even have some in stock. I can't tell if that's what I'm looking at over there, but we have some vines over there that are just beautiful, that are annual, and you just put them in each year and they're gorgeous. Or you can even bring them in for the winter. Let's see, I think we have another question over here. Yes. Yeah, can any of these plants be um, 
grown in a stone kind of a soil, stony field. In a stony soil? Yeah. You know what? Again, these are the plants that if anything's going to tolerate your soil, it's going to be these. Really? These are the tougher plants. But do keep them in a pot at first? Um, that's up to you. You okay. want to keep it in a pot temporarily or permanently? That's up to you. Or you can put it right into the ground. So when you dig the hole to plant in the ground, uh -huh. try to remove at least all the bigger rocks. Yeah. We recommend that you try to pull out everything bigger than a golf ball. Uh, I know you can't pull out every little pebble, but at least try to get the big ones. <laughs> uh, especially when you're only digging a small hole anyway. Yeah. You want to really get all those rocks out. And then uh, take the, the dirt that's left over and mix it with a premium mulch and also some of the all-purpose fertilizer. And you want to dig that hole two to, uh, two to three times as wide as the, the root ball. So if I was planting this, I, you know, make sure my, my hole is bigger. Mm -hmm. And then I put a, kind of rough up the root ball a little bit and then put it in there so that the surface of the, the root ball is level with the ground. I'd rather go too high than too low if need be. Yeah. Uh, put that in there and then take that, that dirt that you dug out, mix it with the premium, premium mulch and the uh, water's all purpose and then pack them in around the roots and give it a real good watering and uh, I would even say a, a good dose of uh, the root and grow will really get it off to a great start. And then just regular watering and, and root treatments after that and you'll have a, a thriving, thriving plant. That goes for the trees, that goes for the flowers, the shrubs, the vines. It's the same for all of them. And yes, a lot of us have very rocky soil. It's pretty normal here, but if you yeah. follow those steps, you'll end up with a great plant. Good. Are most of these best planted in spring? Are most of these best planted in spring? You know, we don't have an off season here. We just have good, better, and best. Spring is a great time to plant. Fall is too. And if we're getting a good monsoon, monsoon is too, actually. <laughs> uh, so yeah, those are great times to plant. I would say whenever the plant is available. You know, some of them are available in spring and others don't come into late summer or fall. So it just depends on when it comes in. Okay. Anyone else? Ella, could you mention water? the importance of water and yes. attracting birds, butterflies, pollinators? You know, I can really, um, are you talking about watering the plant or, no, the, no. or putting out water? Adding water for wildlife. Yeah. Okay, adding water for wildlife. And actually, we probably should mention watering the plants too, actually. Uh, as, let, me, let me tell you something. I, I tell you, I, I've got areas that I really neglect in my, in my landscape. So I've learned this. You could put in a plant that's tough enough to survive neglect, but I find that there's an establishment period, you know, that first year, maybe two, where you really should water. Even if it seems to be doing okay without it, I find that they just don't grow as much. They kind of sit there waiting, waiting for something to happen during that establishment period. So you do want to, to water. Sometimes I'll put something in and I'll forget that I even did it. And, Sometimes I'll walk by it and think, oh yeah, I should water that. And then I forget all about it again. And so I've learned this school of hard knocks. You really should water. Even though you're putting in drought tolerant plants, please try to remember to water during that establishment period. Those first uh, couple of years are really important for getting a strong, healthy plant that can survive anything. And then as for putting out water for the wildlife itself, great subject to bring up. It is a great idea. If you want to bring in more wildlife, whether it be birds or, or even things like uh, you know, other types of animals, putting out water like in a bird bath or a pan on the ground will do a go a long, long way. It also sometimes will keep things from eating the juicier plants in your garden. <laughs> sometimes they're just plain thirsty out there. But the birds always love a good bird bath. We have some, some bird baths down there that you can either put on a stand or into a hanger. We've got some beautiful hangers and dishes down there. Uh, I know where, uh, if you want to take a look, they're, they're lovely and they're perfect for this, uh, for this purpose. And the nice thing about the hanging ones is you don't have to worry about the javelina knocking them over. <laughs> All right, yes. When would be the last date of in Prescott that you would uh, fertilize perennials? Fertilize perennials. perennials. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, with the water's all purpose, it's in all seasons. There's no time when you can't fertilize. You know, it's not going to hurt anything. It's not, 
it, it's so well balanced that you don't have to worry about well, what is the last possible date I can use it. So you can go ahead and use it every three months of the year. We recommend that you do one somewhere around October, early November-ish, right in there. You know, just before you're going into winter, in the fall time, you should go ahead and fertilize and then do it again uh, just as spring is about to hit. So you do it every, every three months with that fertilizer and you're good to go. It's a very easy plant food to use. That's what I use at home. And did you talk about the very last one on the table? Is that a, the bee balm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is bee balm. This is a sun lover. Uh, if you put this in the shade, it will be covered in mildew. <laughs> it loves sun. <laughs> Uh, the, fuzzy, the fuzzy leaves do kind of help protect it from being eaten by uh, deer and javelina, but the pollinators love bee balm. This is, I mean, it's in the name for a reason. They love bee balm. So this is a great one to go with. You'll even find it in wildflower mixes if you're looking at the seed. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yes. Um, it's not in bloom at the moment, but the, it had a lot of them on there. Uh, they come in pink or purple colors like that. Um, so it's been it's been dead headed, and now it's got a lot of new growth coming out. It's about to bloom again. Um, how tall? I want to say about twelve feet at the most. So it's not a real tall one. Let's see anything else? Yes. Uh, lower elevations, four thousand feet, will will it be too high? A lot of this actually is. is more versatile. Uh, a lot of this can go down to 4,000 feet, no problem at all. Uh, is there anything here that can't? I raised my family in Skull Valley, 4,200 feet. Yeah. All of that's grown. Well, yeah. All of it's fine. Yeah. 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 yeah, this is pretty versatile stuff. So, takes the heat, takes the cold. Yeah, that's great. All right. Ella, would you mind if I shared a couple? Sure. Couple yeah, come on Just, just kind of. Things. Uh, hi, my name's Ken. Hi, Ken. Uh, I own the Garden Center, but Ella is our expert on butterflies, One of them. <laughs> uh, bees, and that kind of stuff. But I do garden for the birds. There's a couple tips that can probably help you. I've got a waterfall in the in the backyard. The big birds like that, dove, quail, that kind of stuff. So if you have some running water, they'll really be attracted. To that. The small birds don't like that. They don't hang out because the big birds hang out there. So I had a kestrel going across yesterday. I've had eagles, blue herons. They've all kind of gathered where the pond is. It's not something glorious. It's just it's a small thing, maybe 700 gallons with a recirculating pump, and it works. The front yard, I've got an actual uh, um, fountain. It's a piece of granite where water just bubbles up and kind of flows over. It just recirculates. The water's actually underground. You don't see the actual water basin. But the, it's kind of decorative, but in the morning, I got that on a timer, so it comes on at like 6 o'clock in the morning, and it shuts off just for efficiencies. The birds will actually be waiting. They know when the timer is going to come on. They'll be waiting in line to get to that. The hummingbirds love that. The smaller birds, the robins, I've literally seen robins line up. I mean like a herd of them, like a flock, like, like 20 of them. They'll be waiting in line, they just take turns. They rotate through, it's, it's hilarious to watch. But the smaller bird, robin and smaller, uh, they, they like the smaller fountain, smaller features, bird baths, that kind of, they feel safer there. And then uh, cover, you need a place for them to feel safe. If you just put, you know, this lantana, which my neighbor is like, he's like Mr. Lantana, his house is wrapped at this plant, it is amazing. And I think he brings the butterflies in and then they just kind of gander over to my place and I get to enjoy them too. Uh, but you need a place for the birds to feel safe. Mainly, this, that's a junipers. Uh, I've got a big uh, uh, um, alligator juniper in the back. They all hang out in there. When it's snowing outside, they hang out in there. Uh, spruce, pine, they love evergreens, uh, vines. Uh, they love uh, Virginia creeper. It's a native. It just grows wild. They're used to it. They like to roost in it. So especially your smaller birds, like hummingbirds, they like to be up about this level or higher. You'll see this little tiny nest sitting around, and they'll be, they'll be out there. They never make a sound. You never hear the, the chicks, uh, but you do the sparrows, the, the other, the little bit next size up, you'll hear them 
you know, calling out, going, feed me more. <laughs> and so something else I noticed, if you're just getting started, it's, it's like birds build over time. I think it's something about they know where they came from, so they go south for winter and they come back. And my first year, I set up this whole landscape. I mean, it's a glorious landscape. I mean, you might think I own a garden center or something. It's like <laughs> over the top. And I went, oh, the birds will come. And they didn't come. The next year, they started to show up. And then like year three and on, they're so thick, you can't walk the yard without one of them you know, buzzing by you. Uh, so it builds, and I think it's just family oriented. They, they invite friends, or you know, it's, this is my place. Bring salsa and chips, and we'll have a party in the backyard. And it just takes a while for them. <laughs> so be patient with the wildlife. Uh, and then your your butterflies are thick right now. How many of you are on Facebook? Okay, half the crowd, maybe a little over half. Follow Waters Garden Center. Just selfish promotion, but. Uh, I, that's kind of my personal page, my gardens. You're going to see my gardens. So I was out in the backyard, and a swallowtail, I, it, it was this big, the biggest thing I've ever seen. It was on my pentas, which is a little little flower. I got so close to him that literally the, the camera bumped him in the eye. It, the camera was out of focus. Before I had to back off, he was so focused on getting the nectar from this flower. It's ridiculous. Uh, but those kind, of, if you like gardening info, kind of take a look at it. Hit the follow button, and you'll get, you'll be, you'll be part of the waters world at that point, which is all gardening, total gardening, and a lot of it's my gardens. Uh, and then lastly, I'll leave you with this: we have so much rock in the yard that sometimes your yard is too sterile to bother with. They don't like rock. They like plants. They like butterflies. Especially the guys like the uh, fly catchers, they like pecking around in the litter underneath. They like looking for worms. They like, they like pecking around at stuff. So if you could, bottom dress your shrubs or, or, or have an underplanting or add some shredded cedar or something to the rock. Don't go rock right up to your, to your trees. Give them something to, be, to attract them in to kind of peck around at. So my entire backyard, which is where the birds, that's the bird gardens, uh, the whole thing is there's no rock. It's all shredded cedar, it's got top dressing, and so the birds really come after, especially quail and that kind of stuff. They love to, just in the morning, you'll just see where they're pecking around and stuff. So some of it's not just about the plants, some of it's about the environment that they're into. I have no feeders. Uh, they're, they're all about the plants. I think my neighbors have some feeders, so they bring them in and they come and water at my place. Uh, so, but I've got beautiful plants. I've got a place where they, they're safe. One that I did plant that's like a magic plant for butterflies and hummingbirds, both. The, probably the number one, and this is a great one. It's pretty, it's a native, it's drought hardy. But for me in my yards, I planted mimosa or silk tassel tree. It's a bit weedy, a bit uh, messy, but I've got an area where it just doesn't matter. That's where the birds gather. But I've got it planted underneath the deck, so I've got a one and a half story deck. I'm overlooking the dells. I didn't want a tree to block that, that view, but I want to attract the birds, bees, and butterflies. And so this tree grows up to about, I don't know, mid-teens, 20 feet, no more. So I'm overlooking the tops of these trees, which have these silky tassel, pink, silky flowers and every evening, the thing is covered, it's ridiculous, in, in uh, uh, painted ladies, monarchs, swallowtails, and hummingbirds are just thick. They're just after the nectar on that tree. So some, some plants uh, are, attract more than others. And so we've got less resources. In fact, what I'll do, just to get you to kind of come to our Facebook page, I'll put a link to the butterfly and hummingbird list. So you can hit that link and open it up and it's a PDF file. So if you folks listening or watching online, thank you. It'll be there in an hour. So you can go back and take a look and it'll be a free, uh, uh, just our handout on how to attract the plants that attract butterflies. That's some things I've done that yeah. kind of help. And if, if we share the stories, I'm sure we can get 20 other ideas you get 10 gardeners in a room and ask them a question, I'm sure you'll get 12 answers. <laughs> That's just the way gardening is. So one last question, and we'll give it up to Ella, so I'll let you answer that. Okay, we're new to the area. Welcome. And we have discovered something that we didn't 
know exists at Hamilton's. Oh, yeah. oh no. <laughs> no, we knew that. No, we came from Strawberry. Yeah. Toads. Toads, okay. <laughs> Tell me what they're good for. Like in the, <laughs> the ecosystem? <laughs> they're talking frogs, right? Yeah. The toad frog, yeah. Yeah. So the question is, why is she seeing toads all of a sudden? Well, it's because it's monsoon season. So here's what happens with toads. Um, they're above ground when there's enough moisture for them, when there's water to drink and things to attract insects for them to eat and blah, 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 and not dry out, basically. When it starts uh, drying up again, before it dries up, they'll bury themselves in the soil and stay there. They'll actually uh, live underground for months and months at a time. They just go dormant, they, they hibernate and the surface of the soil will dry out over the top of them and actually trap them in, that's okay. They are completely hibernating, they are asleep. I've, I've dug them up by accident before and then the poor things, they, they, they lie there. <laughs> and then they kind of crack open an eye and look at you like, oh, five more minutes. <laughs> so, uh, basically what happens is when the rainy season, like say the spring rains or or, but especially monsoon rains when it's warm come along and that ground gets wet again and softens up, uh, then they feel it and they wake up and because the ground is nice and wet and soft, then they're able to, to get back out of the ground. And so monsoon time, you'll see all these toads suddenly hatching out after you've had one or two good rains. Uh, so we didn't get a lot of rain here this year, this monsoon was pretty awful, but it was just yes. enough. Yes. <laughs> yes. We're still hoping. Monsoon can go into September, so we're still hoping. But we have had enough that the toads have cracked out of the ground. So some, some of you, especially if you're near wild areas, you, you just all of a sudden see all these toads all over the place and you're wondering what is going on here. And then it's just a, a perfectly normal part of our, our cycle here. You call them toads. <laughs> That's what I call these because of frog. Mostly toads. I think some of them actually are frogs. And if you want to get I have into... frogs in my backyard. Yeah. They, they're trekked to the water. They're beautiful sounding. Yeah. Drives the neighbors crazy because they're so loud. But they get rid of grasshoppers, crickets, pill bugs, lace. They get rid of insects that are a nuisance. Yes. They eat insects. your vegetables. And they're good yeah. watchdogs. Very good. Because we knew when they, we would look around as soon as they stopped croaking. <laughs> really? Look around and see what's going on. There's something in the neighborhood. Kind of like yeah. the cicadas start up when you go by them.